our first speaker. Let's see. Sorry, I don't have my notes in front of me. I had them all up and now I don't. Okay, um, so we're very lucky to have Therese Fenn with us today. Um, Therese is an RN with more than 30 years of infection prevention experience. She holds national certifications in infection prevention and is the Region 1 infection preventionist for the Oregon Health Authority's Health Care Associated Infections Program based in Portland. Therese's responsibilities are focused on working directly with facilities and local public health agencies to support them during outbreaks or when in high risk uh, pathogens occur in their facility. She works with the National Infection Control Organizations, such as the Association of Infection Control and Epidemiology, to develop national infection control policy and practice guidance documents. She participated in a test question development for the National Certification Board of Infection Controls Long-Term Care Facility Infection Control Certification Exam. Teresa's real passion is helping healthcare organizations implement infection prevention systems that prevent outbreaks and ensure long-term quality and care improvements. So please welcome Therese. Hi everyone, I'm so glad to be here today to talk about multi-drug resistance and uh, Canada Oris. Um, I am gonna go ahead and <clears throat> share my screen and then I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna turn off my camera because I know bandwidth is a little shaky for some folks and um, it might help with the presentation. I also am going to drop a bunch of links into the chat. Um, these are um, uh, links that I refer to through the presentation and I wanna make those available to all of you. So um, those will be in the chat if um, you wanna go ahead and, um, and connect with those. And that shows at the beginning. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to begin screen sh sharing. And um, does everyone see the screen okay? Yes, we do. Perfect. Um, and so we'll be talking about multi-drug resistant organisms and um, sort of how they've uh, uh, spread so far here in this uh, state of Oregon. And um, I don't know how familiar folks are with the uh, regional infection preventionists with the Oregon Health Authority, but I did want to just um, throw up a map and um, show that, um, you know, there are six of us here in the state. So for those of you that are uh, part of um, large chains, I have counterparts throughout the state that you can connect with for infection prevention resources. And um, I strongly encourage you to reach out to me if you would like to connect with any of um, any of these uh, IPs and other parts of the state. So our agenda today is, um, I'm sorry, I have a dog scratching at the door, sorry. Winston, out. Daryl, can you get the dog, please? Sorry, I have a new puppy. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> he doesn't like to be alone. Uh, so our agenda today is um, I want to give you a little background in understanding uh, multidrug resistant organisms and which uh, there are a couple of these that um, are uh, becoming emerging pathogen threats. So I, um, my purpose really is to heighten your awareness of them. And then also really what are the strategies that we can use to prevent uh, the spread of these in our long-term care settings. So this umbrella kind of covers our multi-drug resistant organisms. The, the ones on the right of the umbrella, I think most of us are pretty familiar with, MRSA, VRE, uh, C. diff. Um, it, but it's the ones on the left that I really want us to be focusing in on today. 
and um, um, for you to be aware that the these are um, there are new reportable conditions um, for carbapenemate carbapenem resistant acinetobacter, which is the CRA, and then carbapenemase producing of any species. And I'm going to um, highlight how you can identify those uh, in in your uh, uh, patient population. And then also Candida auris, uh, which actually fell off the reportable list in uh, March of 2021 for some reason, but um, it has been re-added and um, is imp an important pathogen to make sure uh, it, it is reported. So um, we have these two pathogens of concern that we'll focus on today. Um, one is this uh, carbapenemase producing organisms or CPOs, and the other is uh, Candida auris. And it's important to um, be aware that these two organisms kind of hold hands, you know, um, they spread silently together. Um, they, uh, um, affect the most medically vulnerable in our populations, and they are very effective in exploiting gaps in our infection prevention programs. So um, uh, some key features for these both are that they commonly cause infections in healthcare settings. They're spread by contact with infected or colonized people or the environment. They both demonstrate high levels of antibiotic resistance, pose a serious potential for outbreaks, are associated with higher levels of morbidity and mortality when uh, they are causing an infection, and are high risk for importation in sustained transmission in congregate settings. And I'm going to show you some examples of that as we go through um, the presentation today. But the individuals that are um, at increased risk of acquiring Candida auris and other multidrug resistant organisms, I'm sure these are going to sound familiar to you based on your populations in your facility. So those with um, serious underlying medical conditions, long healthcare facility stays, individuals who have um, indwelling medical devices that allow entry of these organisms into the body, um, those who have frequent healthcare worker contact and prolonged exposure to and broad spectrum antibiotics. So um, I'm sure we don't have to think very long for examples that we have in our facilities. So the first um, component we'll focus in and in on are these carbapenemase producing organisms or CPOs is how we're referring to them. And this is a graphic that just shows one of these um, um, CPOs, carbapenemases, um, and how it spread in the in the United States from two states in 2001 to all 50 states by um, 2017. So, you know, 16 years later. So, um, you know, the 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 impact is quite significant, and they are uh, very adept at uh, at spreading and um, surviving these these organisms. And I just want, as we talk about this, I just want you to be aware that resistance in bacteria simply um, uh, uh, develops in a couple of different ways. One is kind of the more common where they acquire genes or mutations, um, such as the bacteria has fewer areas for the antibiotic to get into the cell, or they get better at removing the antibiotic from the cell. So those are kind of our standard um, resistance and uh, uh, mechanisms. What we're really focusing in on is the one here on the right, which are these carbapenemases. And these organisms actually produce an enzyme that destroys carbapenem or uh, antibiotics. And carbapenems are our last line defense antibiotics. So they're very important in our infectious disease um, uh, armamentarium. Um, so, um, you know, they're resistant to carbapenem 
or antibiotics, they produce this enzyme that breaks down these antibiotics and they, they are, the resistance can spread very quickly to other bacteria because they're quite efficient at sharing information. And I'll share a little bit about that. But the other thing to keep in mind is that these are gram negative organisms. So these are gut bugs and um, they are part of our uh, oftentimes uh, a normal healthy gut. They help us produce energy, digest our food, manufacture vitamins, support our immune system, all that kind of thing. So we can't get rid of them. And once they acquire this resistance capacity, it's hard to eliminate it. So um, that's important to remember as we're continuing to work with um, patients and residents who have these organisms. Bacteria also replicate, replicate really quickly and spread effectively and efficiently to other uh, gram negatives through um, some mechanisms that I'm going to show you in just a moment. So how to think of these organisms as a whole. So we have carbapenem, uh, carbapenem resistant organisms is sort of the larger um, uh, bunch of these, and that's carbapenem resistant enterobacterales. Crab and CR, uh, carbapenem resistant pseudomonas. But it's this small subset within these resistance that, um, this resistance category that usually is indicated by a CP at the beginning. And that's what you really want to pay attention to when you see it because it designates them as producing the enzyme. Um, and one of the reasons why that's really important is that they have this very efficient mechanism. And I'm not gonna go into a lot of the detail in the image, but essentially want you to know that this is the image of a gram negative organism. And within the organism is this little mobile um, genetic element called a plasmid. And what happens is, for instance, in this image, we have a donor bacteria who has this plasmid to produce carbapenemase, um, um, uh, uh, carb carbapenemase. And essentially, this is like unsafe sex between microbes. It sends out this transposon and, sa and says to an E. coli, hook up with me, and I'm gonna share this package with you. And that's why these organisms actually lead to a rapid spread of resistance um, and why we really want to keep an eye on what's happening with them in our long-term care population. If you have any questions as we go, if um, uh, I have a few minutes, if I have a few minutes at the end, drop them in the chat and I'll try to address them. Um, Here's a trend. We had our first C CPCRE in 2010, and you can see, you know, our numbers were pretty low for a few years, and we're still low in comparison to other uh, other states. However, there really is starting to see an increase, um, you know, after COVID, and the different colors on the bars are different types of mechanisms that the that the organism um, uses, whether it's a KPC or um, VIM or whatever. So um, that's essentially what uh, the this slide is depicting. But you know, you can see that the overall trend is going up. So the second organism I want to talk about is the Candida auris, and Candida auris is a yeast. Um, or a fungus, and some strains of Candida auris are resistant to all classes of available antifungal fungals. They persistently uh, colonize patients, and they really demonstrate a efficient capacity to contaminate the healthcare environment. And this really allows for easy spread on the hands and on uh, on the equipment. So we had our first um, case in Oregon in December 2021, which resulted in a large multi-facility outbreak investigation and um, spread to two other uh, to two other individuals as a result. I'm going to run through the next slide really quickly, but again, it's going to demonstrate how efficient um, spread occurs with uh, Candida auris. 
So the first case of Canada Oris was identified um, clinical case in 2016. They did a look back and they found a couple of other, other isolates um, uh, back into 2013. But um, keep an eye on Illinois here. And the cases are gray zero cases, this light yellow one to 10 and um, uh, moving onward in deepening of the color. So here we are a year later, we've had increased spread in California, um, Oklahoma, Texas, Florida, et cetera. New York is now orange, Illinois is um, you know, a darker, a darker yellow. And two years after that, we now have between 100 and 500 cases in Illinois and New York, um, increased cases in Florida and um, uh, California. Here in 2021, we see our first case in, in Oregon and um, you know more states turning red and orange. So we're definitely sp seeing spread throughout the United States. These um, events tend to make the headlines, um, and here's a few uh, headlines from local and national news. When Oregon had its first cases of Canada Oris. And one of the things to keep in mind is, you know, we can have patients who are colonized or infected with these multi-drug resistant organisms. The clinical cases are causing an infection. They often have symptoms. They can spread the organism. Oftentimes they have a higher number of them. And particularly with Candida auris, they have very poor outcomes. Um, one in three patients with Candida infection will not survive the infection. But also it's like what's under, what's below the surface of the iceberg um, with colonized cases. So, you know, because CPOs are gut organisms, they can live inside the gut for extended period of time, um, as can the Candida auris. It can also be on the skin. It doesn't cause infection, so they can be silently spreading. In an organization, they exist for long periods of time. and. Um, and because of that, it can increase the risk for spreading in an organization and pose more of a risk for obviously for developing an infection if you are colonized. Now, we can be successful. We have some good examples of success in reducing clinical cases. So here on the left, you can see um, um, that there are two states that are out, uh, two areas that are outlined. One is here in Oklahoma, and then here's Massachusetts, and I believe it's Connecticut, um, that had cases in 2017. And then if we fast forward, we can see no cases in Oklahoma. So they haven't seen on ongoing cases, and also in, in these two New England states. Um, whereas some states really are continuing to see spread. So there are ways of um, limiting spread, and um, I would like to sort of talk a little bit about that now. Um, we can act now to prevent this from really getting a foothold in the in this state. And um, if doing that now will protect resources, slow or reduce our spread, reduce resident and patient morbidity and mortality and improve patient res and resident safety. So this next part of the presentation will really be on prevention strategies. So it's important to know that there's a lot going on um, behind the scenes for you with public health, preve public health prevention efforts. We're expanding our Oregon Health Authority HAI team. Um, we're working to support local health, local public health through providing targeted training and webinars. Um, we have some new state lab technology that improves the, our ability to identify these organisms. Many of you already know about the antibiotic um, resistance information exchange, but that's a really important way to get notified if you have a patient admitted with um, an MDRO. Um, if you haven't already done that, um, you know, it, and I would encourage you to enroll. And um, I put in Luke uh, Logan's um, email, but it's uh, the costs of this are covered by OHA. So um, Logan's email at point click care is available here. 
And I want to I really want to focus on this fifth block, which is working closely with facilities. Um, those who are at most at risk of encountering a CPO in Canada Auris, such as chronic vent environments or um, long-term acute care hospitals, but also um, facilities that see a single case of this that are then at most at risk for um, having an outbreak. So targeting prevention strategies, uh, there's a number of these. One is education is really important for both your administrators, infection preventionists, and also your frontline healthcare workers. Ensuring that you have good communication strategies within the organization and also with your, um, with your care partners um, and anyone who is um, being, uh, your residents are being transferred to. Improving your infection prevention practices before you have a single case so that those organisms can't um, take advantage of lapses in infection control. Um, I'm going to review some impl implementing some patient care strategies, um, review of environment of care practices, antimicrobial stewardship, and um, what happens when you have a single new case and what that case response will look like. But it's um, the other thing I really want to highlight is that the Oregon Health Authority regional IPs, all of us are available to assist these measures with these measures, any one or all of them, through our proactive ICARs. And there's a link that I've given you for uh, requesting an ICAR. And I would um, really invite you to um, reach out to me. Uh, I love to work with people proactively. I'm not regulatory, so there isn't anything about working with me that would trigger a, um, you know, a regulatory citation. So in educating and strengthening your infection prevention program, um, you know, have policy and procedures in place so that you have a response plan for first case. Grow your local IP expertise. Um, you know, it's have some redundancy in your infection prevention program. So if you lose an IP, you have some backup. There's a CDC certificate, um, our national APIC um, infection control uh, professional organization has an associate IPC certification, a long-term care CIP certification, as well as the full CIC certification. So do whatever you can to support your IP expertise locally. And then um, conduct all staff education that's relevant, that, you know, make it as interesting as you can, um, interactive and fun. Um, I do have some great games, Jeopardy, there's a scavenger hunt. Um, I've seen facilities do ex uh, escape rooms. So whatever you can do to, um, you know, make education fun. Also, um, you know, I put an old fashioned phone here um, because kind of old fashioned communication strategies are really valuable. You know, use phone and written communication for facilities that are receiving patients that have MDROs. Make sure that you're getting that information as part of your handoff reporting when they're coming from um, acute care facilities. Make sure your charts are flagged. And then when you do have cases, daily huddles with your staff are incredibly valuable. Um, so some patient care strategies. And again, you know, I can help you with an, a proactive ICAR in uh, coming together with a plan. But again, that chart flagging and notification, um, patient and resident education is really important here. Continuing the patient on enhanced barrier precautions um, indefinitely is what our current recommendation is. Monitoring them um, for signs and symptoms of infection. And there's also some things that we can do about skin hygiene practices in this population. And um, it's a little more detailed than what I would go through, go into here, but would certainly provide resources and, um, during a, um, an ICAR. We wouldn't talk about hand, uh, infection control if we didn't bring up hand hygiene practices, but with these um, types of infections, it's really important that you're monitoring your hand hy hygiene compliance. Oftentimes things aren't happening in the, in the environment the way that you think they are. Engineer your environment to make it as easy as possible for people, you know, for your workers to perform hand hygiene by having that 
um, hand rub, alcohol hand rub available at the room um, entry, as well in con common space, as well as common spaces and dining area. Include residents in hand hygiene opportunities, especially if they're cognitively impaired and have physical limitations. It can affect their ability to um, perform hand hygiene and they can spread it on their own hands. Um, so uh, as far as strengthening, um, we'll be putting together IP office hours. We're calling that IP uh, power hour here in uh, region one. This is a QR code to connect with Project First Line. If you haven't already done that with your staff, I strongly encourage you to. You can request a proactive ICAR with me. I know I've mentioned it before, but it really could can be very helpful. Um, we can talk about things like details around environment of care practices, what you're using to clean and disinfecting and disinfect your environment. I'm strongly recommending use of EPA list P products, which have standard effectiveness against Canada Oris um, because it can spread so quickly and silently. Excuse me, reduce clutter. Um, pay attention to your equipment management practices to make sure that they're um, being routinely disinfected. And then um, addressing wastewater resources is really important. Your sink drains, your toilets, and your hoppers. Those are all things that we can talk about um, during an ICAR. And it's also important to um, strengthen antimicrobial stewardship. Um, and that's this is key to re reducing the emergence of um, resistance. Um, and there are some uh, links for training, as well as Elizabeth Breitenstein. She's our OHA um, antimicrobial stewardship. She's an amazing resource. So, um, you know, I strongly encourage you to um, check into some of those stu stewardship resources if you haven't already. And then I think it's important that you know, in a first case, you're not alone. A case, a single case of CPO or Canada Oris triggers a public health response. And that typically includes um, a, a responsive infection control assessment and recommendations to help you reduce the risk for spread and often surveillance swaps to make sure that it hasn't spread. So, you know, keep in mind that, you know, when it when it happens, if it happens, you are not alone. So um, in summary, really, you know, together we can act now to make um, these long term care settings safer um, and prevent prevent CPO in Canada or us in in Oregon. And these are just the resources. If you have any questions, um, I don't know how we are doing for time, um, but um, I can either take questions or you can email me. I see someone has their hand up. I'm gonna yeah. stop. Thank you. Thank you so much, Therese. Uh, Sanghe, uh, you had a question? Yeah, I do. <laughs> um, so how long do you, recommended to follow up to the um some precaution or patient identification like a chart flag or uh transportation notification like that how long do we have to follow up that one yeah so um one of the i think one of the biggest gaps that i'm seeing when i do responsive icars for new cases is um where where i think in general we're follow, falling a little short in notifying or educating patients that have these organisms how important their role is in notifying any healthcare provider emergency room transport that they should be handled with contact precautions um so i think that's one um one part of it is patient education Electronic chart flagging is really important and also combining paper transfer forms that indicate someone has an MDRO with a phone call, a, a, a verbal handoff communication from staff, clinical staff to receiving clinical staff. Sangeet, does that answer your question? Um, my question is uh, how long? Do they have to follow in? Well, right now, 
Yeah, well, right now we're saying indef indefinitely because the opportunity to um, rid, rid them of these organisms is pretty difficult. And that until they're actually cleared by infectious diseases, we would say they should continue precautions and ex enhanced barrier precautions in the, in the um, long-term care setting. So basically, we would put them on contact precautions and not take them off. All right. Thank you. Or, I'm sorry, change them to enhance barrier precautions once the infection, the active infection is resolved. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Therese. It's this was really helpful. Very thorough. Um, OK, I'm going to uh, launch a quick poll. It's an anonymous poll. Um, should see it. Yeah. So keep that open for a minute while Siobhan is pulling up her slides. All right. Um, we can come back to the poll at the end of this presentation and then we'll make a quick transition until we get to the next one. So um, my name is uh, Siobhan Burns. I am the communicable disease epidemiologist for Washington County. Um, I am in the RAID program, um, so it's kind of a sister program to the communicable disease program. I work very closely with the nurses, reviewing cases and looking at uh, trends that are happening. So I want to show you first to start off looking at um, flu trends. This is actually for last year. So this was for 2022-2023 season. And this is from the Oregon Flu Bites report, which is open to subscribe to, as well as the RSV report. They're great reports that are produced every week. They give us an idea of what's happening for test positivity, hospitalizations, that type of thing. So a lot of these graphics are pulled from there. Um, and what you'll notice in this particular uh, chart is that um, the majority of outbreaks that we see are either in schools, daycares, or long-term care facilities. So both of these um, facilities represent congregate settings, but with very different risk factors, including age and underlying health conditions. It's also important to note that really, um, as far as congregate settings, these are the main areas that we're tracking, looking at schools, long-term cares, hospitals, other uh, congregate settings, which might include like jails, um, prisons, that type of thing. Looking at this graph is showing us the percent positive influenza tests by season reported through the Oregon Influenza Lab Surveillance Program. And this is a network of labs around the state that report back to the Oregon Health Authority. They're Sentinel labs um, and they are very critical in giving us information about what's happening as far as the baseline levels of flu that's circulating in the community, as well as when we start to see that onset of the flu season. Um, it also kind of gives us an idea of an estimate of the burden of disease in the community, since not all labs are going to be reporting positive flu tests to the state. Last year, we saw a very early onset of flu season in mid-November, which was very unusual. You can see that in the dark purple line. Um, this year, we are much closer to matching the five-year trend with a more typical start of the flu season in mid-December. For week one, which was ending or began December 31st, um, we saw the percent of positivity drop just slightly from 10.9 to 10.5, but overall we did see an increase in hospitalizations and emergency room visits for flu-like illness. Right now, influenza A is driving most of the numbers at over 90% of the tested patients, but um, on an earlier call with the health systems, uh, with the state, um, they said that you know we might see influenza B start showing up maybe in the next month or so. So we aren't saying flu season is over, um, it looks like we're still just right in the early part of it. 
This chart is showing the rate of distribution of influenza associated hospitalizations by both week and age group in the Portland metro area. And you can see that we've had a pretty steady increase since mid November, especially among those that are 65 years and older. Statewide hospitalizations were up 51 compared to 45 for the last week of December, and ED visits were also slightly higher as well. We really do want to do our best to try and protect the most vulnerable by encouraging anyone eligible to try and get their animal flu shot. That includes staff as well as residents, and I really want to thank all of the long-term care facilities that have helped set up vaccination clinics at your site because ease of access is a major factor that contributes to staying up to date on your vaccinations. A lot of times it's really difficult to either get to your provider to get the shot set up or to be able to take time out of your work schedule to be able to get to um, a pharmacy or your physician to get those shots done. For flu, our vaccination rates are lower this year compared to the last three years and significantly lower compared to um, the 2020-2021 season during the pandemic. And this is concerning because with the greater community coverage rate, we have better overall protection, especially for the high risk populations. Um, this year, we're only reporting about 1.21 million influenza immunizations administered since July 30th, 2023, compared to 1.3 million flu shots administered at the same time period last year. And by CDC reporting weeks, this is on par with past seasons for January, but overall, again, much lower than what we saw uh, during the pandemic. Um, which during the pandemic, we actually saw a record of 1.63 million vaccines administered between 2020 and 2021. Oregon's most recent population estimate is approximately 4.2 million for 2024. So to give you an idea of the coverage rate, we're sitting around 30% of the total population. And as of January 4th, 40.8% of eligible adults in Oregon had received a flu shot and 20.3 had received their RSV vaccine. So that's very low for the RSV vaccine. This map is looking at the proportion of outpatient visits to healthcare providers for influenza-like illness, or ILIs, and it measures the flu activity within a state. This kind of gives us an idea of what's happening across the nation as far as ge like the geographical burden of disease, but this doesn't give us like that fine tuning between what's happening in urban regions compared to more rural populations. Um, what we can see from this map is almost the entire country is reporting extremely high to very high um, influenza-like illness activity levels, with Alaska, Oregon, Utah, South Dakota, Minnesota, West Virginia, and Vermont being lower than the national trend. For Hawaii, uh, Puerto Rico, and Virgin and North Marianas Islands, activity is notably low, but to take into consideration that tropical and subtropical regions generally don't follow the same winter seasonality that you see in flu trends, um, and they can actually have their flu season onset at any time. You don't see it happen uh, Jan you know, December through February, like you'll see in more temperate nor northern regions. For RSV season, we actually already may have reached our peak. Uh, the state's not willing to call that yet, but we did have a significant drop in positivity for um, tests. Um, this chart is showing the rate and distribution of RSV associated hospitalizations by week and age for the Portland metro area. And again, RSV, um, respiratory syncytial virus, is something that impacts newborns and children under the age of two, as well as those that are over 65 or immunocompromised. So again, we're really pushing to get up above that 20% threshold for eligible adults, um, especially in that 65 and older age group. Our current test positivity is sitting around 9.5 for PCR and 17.3 for antigen testing. And what's unique about RSV is we have separate cutoffs depending on if they're looking at PCR versus antigen testing because the PCR is so much more sensitive. So RSV season will conclude once we've dropped below that 3% positivity for PCR tests and 10% for the antigen test. Um, again, we did see a sharp decrease for this last week, but we are still very early in respiratory season, so we don't want to say it's over yet. We don't know. We might see a spike come up, but we definitely did have a spike um, during our uh, Christmas and holiday season. This is showing um, just Hillsboro. We also have Forest Grove in Washington County that gives us our waste monitor, wastewater monitoring information. So this is looking at um, the uh, number of viral copies of COVID that are detected in sewage effluent. Um, 
This is very important in helping us to understand the background levels of COVID that is circulating in Oregon, especially since laboratory reporting is no longer required and many people are using home test kits. So we really don't have a good grasp of how many people are actually testing positive with COVID. So this gives us an opportunity to try and quantify what's actually circulating in the community. Um, there is a bit of a time lag that happens with wastewater monitoring. So it can be anywhere between a week to three weeks behind, depending on how long it takes for the samples to be run. But it does give us a holistic picture of how much and where COVID is actually circulating in the population, especially across the state. Um, this, uh, this really helps give us uh, kind of a heads up of like what's going on and where, um, what areas COVID, COVID might be impacting next. COVID really remains the primary driver for respiratory outbreaks in long-term care facilities in Washington County. For the 2023-24 season, almost all the reported outbreaks in congregate settings were COVID with a total of 35 outbreaks reported as of yesterday. We've had so far a single flu and a single RSV outbreak and two GI outbreaks that were reported during that same period. Um, respiratory outbreaks are very difficult to stop once they've started. So implementing masking early, um, isolating sick, persons, whether it's staff or residents, um, implementing a testing plan, making sure you've got the prophylaxis set up to be able to get those requests out to the primary care or um, get those requests out for staff so that they're sick is very, very important. Again, prevention is really the key here and staying current on vaccinations for both residents and staff. Um, Long-term care facilities also represent a greater concern for serious health outcomes, including death, if these outbreaks are not detected early and effectively managed through staff and resident testing, um, getting that profi, and then implementing the infection control procedures at your facility. We can definitely help advise you and provide support, so please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Um, Tricia will be presenting more information on how to report and when to report for these types of situations. And then just a quick you know, touch on GI outbreaks. Thus far, we've only had um, two GI outbreaks for the 2022-23 season. But remember that GI outbreaks are generally caused by norovirus um, and it's a very low dose and it spreads very easily. So making sure that you're cleaning up any vomit or fecal material is a priority and also ensure that the surface has not only been cleaned, but then you apply a disinfectant. And that usually has to have a certain amount of time to hit that kill step. So it may require anywhere between, you know, five to 10 minutes, depending on which disinfectant you're using. And you may have to re-wet the surface. So continually spray to make sure that that surface stays wet during that time to ensure it's actually disinfected. Um, bleach solutions should also be made fresh daily because chlorine is very reactive and it'll quickly degrade once it's made into solution. Um, definitely check your MSDS. You can look those up online for more information regarding appropriate PPE, ventilation, um, what types of surfaces that can be applied to, like bleach should not be applied to marble or other porous surfaces. Um, it also bleaches your clothes. So depending on what your agency approved disinfectant is, make sure you read through that MSDS um, and really look at what that um, application time has to be to properly disinfect the surface. Um, for any GI illness, hand sanitizer is not effective and staff and residents should really be using soap and water to wash their hands. This is where single use hand towels that are either immediately laundered or disposable paper towels, which is much more preferred, are the best during GI outbreaks. And always please reach out if you have any questions or comments. We're really here to facilitate um, getting you linked up to resources. If you need additional PPE, testing kits, um, consults for infection control, anything like that, um, make sure that you are reaching out to us at Washington County. Thank you. Awesome, thanks Siobhan. Um, and now we're gonna hear from Trisha. Hello, uh, I'm Tricia Phillips. I am one of the nurses in communicable disease and I am the ARPA funded um, COVID outbreak nurse um, at this point. Um, thank you very much for coming. 
Let's talk about uh, respiratory and GI illness outbreaks. Um, for cases or suspected outbreaks of reportable diseases, you want to report that to us. Um, anybody that has a chest x-ray confirmed pneumonia in three plus residents, um, unusually high absenteeism by a staff with similar symptoms, uh, any high fevers or bloody stools, and overnight hospitalization with severe or similar symptoms and or deaths, staff or residents. Next slide, please. Um, also when to report, you have two COVID-19 positive persons within a seven day period. Uh, one confirmed lab influenza case with others ill with respiratory disease and one lab confirmed RSV with others ill with respiratory disease. Um, as far as GI illnesses go, you'll want to report when you have two or more residents or staff who are ill within three days of each other. Next slide, please, thank you. And what to report in an initial outbreak, respiratory or GI. Um, the number of staff or residents that are in the facility and the number that are ill. And it's important that you report that on your initial um, email or phone call. Uh, symptoms and onset dates, what your testing plan is, such as a COVID-19 three test series, uh, any labs that you're going to you're going to run a lot of facilities run norovirus and C. diff with their GI um, outbreaks and respiratory, we're doing COVID and flu testing. Um, also, with the initial outbreak report, you'll want to let us know who is isolated and who is excluded as far as staff and residents. Thank you, go ahead. Follow-up reporting, we're going to ask you for a case log. A lot of you have that already on hand. If you could fill that out before you um, send in any information, that's always great. But if you don't have it, we'll send it to you and make sure that you have the correct one to fill out. Um, we also appreciate an in intake, phone call, or email. Um, that can take up to about 15 or 20 minutes of your time um, answering a few questions so we can process the outbreak. Uh, it's important for the follow-up reporting to have the updated case logs when reporting new cases, hospitalization, hospitalizations, or deaths. And we, we will check in with you weekly and we appreciate a check-in with uh, updates on the outbreak progression. This page is our algorithm for outbreaks. It's important that you read through this. I pulled out the important um, facts from this sheet, but it's important that you go over it later and um, read through it so you know what to do in a, any situation. Go ahead, next. How to report. Here is our email address. We do prefer email, but you can also call our main line um, and leave a message and we'll get right back to you within uh, about an hour usually. And um, there's fax if you still want to use that. What to do during an outbreak. Please implement your facility's COVID-19 respiratory or GI infection prevention protocols. It's important that you get on that right away uh, in order to stop the spread. Remember that GI illness requires hand washing and not san hand sanitizer, as uh, Siobhan went over earlier. Um, isolate ill residents, send ill staff home, and exclude ill visitors. Seek care and testing, as we talked about, and follow cleaning and disinfection guidance for your facility. Next slide. Resources here. Um, 
Washington County Long-Term Care Facilities Resources, Washington County Long-Term Care and Foster Home Outbreak Guidance Tool, Infection Control and re Respiratory Pathogens and Long-Term Care Facilities, and Required Reporting Healthcare Associated Infections. Thank you. And that's all that I have to present today. I appreciate everyone being here and taking the time to get up to date on respiratory and GI reporting for outbreaks. Thank you. Great, thank you, Tricia. Um, appreciate that. And I'm gonna launch a little poll, just a kind of a knowledge check um, for folks based on what Trisha just presented. And Tyler, you can go ahead and pull up your piece of that. Um, and I will be sending out the slides uh, subsequent to this along with the recording. So you'll have those resources to reference. Okay. We can see it, Tyler. Uh, okay, perfect. Great. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Again, Tyler Slattery. I'm a senior program coordinator here with Washington County Public Health uh, Communicable Disease Team. Uh, a couple weeks ago, um, I sent out a letter to uh, to facilities, so hopefully you all received it um, on behalf of our Washington County Health Officer, Dr. Christina Bauman, um, just regarding the onset of, of flu season. Um, in the, the Portland metro re region. Um, so as you kind of saw in uh, some of the data that, that Siobhan presented, we're, we're hovering above that, that 10% uh, test positivity rate uh, in Oregon for um, the flu currently. Um, so I'm not gonna go over this whole letter in detail, but just wanted to make sure that everyone, you know, got to get some eyes on it. Um, some of this information uh, we've gone over today already in the previous presentations. Um, but the key points, and I encourage you all to, to take a look at this letter if you have not already, there's a couple of resources and links as well. Um, but a, a couple of the key points, um, just really encouraging and supporting residents and staff to get their flu vaccine. It's it's really not too late. Um, so, so, you know, doing, again, helping residents get get out to providers if needed or doing those in-house um, vaccine clinics, depending on your capacity, um, are all really great. Um, as Trisha went over, uh, in, you know, swiftly implementing control measures um, if you do have a case in the facility or an outbreak. Um, and then the, the the kind of the other key point I just wanted to go over maybe a little bit more um, that hasn't been covered today is really preparing um, uh, for providing Tamiflu um, both as the antiviral treatment um, and as prophylaxis for those who are exposed and at high risk for severe disease. Um, so that could look like working with if you have an in-house physician, getting those standing orders in place or reaching out to residents, um, primary care providers to try to get those standing orders, um, you know, as 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 appropriate. Um, and so just really having those plans in place for for quickly um, being able to respond if there are cases or an outbreak at the facility. Um, and then, of course, um, you know, during an outbreak implementing, it's really important to implement those uh, kind of masking policies, but also potentially considering, you know, as we are in respiratory season, um, looking at at some universal masking in your facilities as well. So um, just some things to consider. Uh, further down this letter just goes into a little bit more detail on all those points. Um, so again, not going to go over that all in, in detail, but do encourage you all to, to take a look and kind of click through onto some of these resources. Uh, feel free to reach out to us if there's any questions, uh, and, and certainly if you're having any cases or outbreaks to your facility. Thank you all. Great. Thank you so much, Tyler. Appreciate that. Um, I'm stopping the recording now and launching a, just a final poll um, as we wrap up here with the last couple minutes. Um, you can select more than one, but in planning for our next um, learning collaborative meeting the next quarter. We'd love to know what information would be helpful to learn more about, um, what you're interested in uh, for future topics. So feel free to contribute to that poll. And um, if there's any final questions or comments before we wrap up,
Bridget, I just wanted to yes, mention please. something. So just want to encourage um, the participants here. I know we have our Washington County folks, of course, but all other long term care facility participants. If you uh, talk to other facilities, please get them involved in this learning learning collaborative. We'd love to have more and more involvement. Um, the more the merrier, the more we can keep our communication and connection going with all, uh, more facilities here in Washington County. So I encourage, please, um, you can forward, I'm assuming, Bridget, we can forward this on to other facilities. Mm -hmm. So please, please do. We really, really want to um, keep this ongoing communication throughout the year so that um, come every respiratory season or outbreak season, we already have some really good connections. So please encourage, um, you know, forwarding, forwarding this forward to others. Thanks. Thank you, Wendy. Awesome. I did want to answer questions real quick for the polls. So the, um, it was a 50-50 split for have you reported an outbreak to Washington County Public Health in the past year? And then there was the question about a resident visited their family over the holidays and tested positive for RSV. Would this be reportable to public health? Um, again, a 50-50 split. And according to our algorithm, if you have one laboratory confirmed RSV case with others ill with respiratory illness, that would be reportable. So say um, maybe you had two residents, one happened to test positive for flu, one for RSV, you know, and you're not sure, but does that count? Just always call us and we will make that decision of yes or no, is that considered an outbreak um, and give you that guidance. So if you ever have any questions of yes, is you know, do, should I report this? When in doubt, just give us a ring um, or drop us an email, let us know what the scenario is and then we will get back to you and let you and follow up with you and give you the answers that you need. And are there any other questions that we can answer? Okay. Uh, well, appreciate everyone's attendance um, today and your feedback on future meetings. That's really helpful for the team. Um, so stay safe out there. Um, hopefully no one's slipping and sliding. It's still pretty slick. So have a good rest of your day and thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.